In the winter of 1683, as the last light of December faded over London, no one could have predicted that they were about to witness one of the most extraordinary periods in English history. The mercury plummeted to unprecedented levels, and what began as an ordinary winter soon revealed itself as something far more sinister. They called it the Great Frost. For nearly three months, England lay frozen in a grip so cold that the Thames London's great artery of commerce and life transformed into a solid highway of ice. Not just thin ice that crackled underfoot, but a mass so thick and unyielding that it bore the weight of horses, carriages, and thousands of curious Londoners. By January 1683, the Thames had frozen to a depth of 11 inches. Think about that. Eleven solid inches of ice where just weeks before, ships had sailed freely. The river that had divided London since Roman times was suddenly no division at all. But nature abhors a vacuum, and where the river's flow had ceased, something remarkable emerged the frost fair. Virtually overnight, an entire city of tents and wooden structures blossomed across the ice. Entrepreneurs, never missing an opportunity, created a bizarre frozen marketplace. Printing presses were dragged onto the ice, producing commemorative cards that read printed on the Thames. Ox roasting spits, coffee houses, and even bowling alleys appeared. One ambitious individual even erected a small building he called the Halfway House precisely halfway between London and Southwark. King Charles II himself walked upon the frozen river, perhaps contemplating how a kingdom that had survived plague, fire, and civil war now faced this new, silent disaster. For disaster it was though less dramatic than those other calamities. Ships sat imprisoned in ice. Trade halted. The poor began to starve as food prices soared beyond reach. What few realize about this period is that the Thames didn't freeze merely because of cold air. London Bridge, with its nineteen narrow arches, acted like a dam, slowing the river's flow enough to allow ice to form. The bridge that connected the city also enabled its transformation into an icy plain. As the weeks wore on, strange phenomena began to occur. Londoners reported hearing thunder like cracks in the night the sound of the river ice shifting beneath the city's weight. Birds fell frozen from the sky. The limited industry of the time breweries, water mills ground to a halt. One little-known account comes from the diary of William Kelly, an Irish merchant who found himself stranded in London. The very air seems to freeze in one's lungs, he wrote. Men grow beards of frost just by breathing. I have seen tears freeze on a child's cheek before they could fall. Perhaps the most fascinating discovery came when gravediggers at St. Sepulchre's church found it impossible to break the frozen ground to bury the increasing number of dead. They reported that the earth was solid to a depth of four feet something never before recorded in English history. Yet amidst this suffering came moments of extraordinary adaptation. A physician named Robert Boyle conducted experiments on the ice, testing the limits of various liquids' freezing points. His work during this brutal winter eventually contributed to our understanding of chemistry and condensation. The wealthy began wearing fox and beaver fur not as fashion statements, but as necessities. Surprising alliances formed as the shared struggle united people across class divides. For a brief moment, the frozen Thames became London's great equalizer, where aristocrats and comma folk rubbed shoulders and shared wonder at nature's transformation. By February's end, when the thaw finally began, London had changed. The great frost had taken hundreds of lives from exposure, starvation, or diseases that flourished in crowded, unventilated rooms where families huddled for warmth. The price of coal had increased tenfold, creating fortunes for some and ruin for many. When the ice finally surrendered its grip, it did so with vengeance. Large chunks careened downstream destroying multiple small vessels and damaging the bridge that had enabled the freezing in the first place. 
Several people who had tempted fate by remaining on the thinning ice perished when it cracked apart without warning. Most astonishing of all, archaeological evidence discovered in the 1970s revealed that beneath some areas of the frost fair, the ice had reached a remarkable 21 inches thick nearly 2 feet of solid ice where tides water normally flowed. The Great Frost of 1683 wasn't merely an extreme weather event. It was the most visible manifestation of what scientists now call the Little Ice Age, a period of global cooling that affected Europe for centuries. The seemingly impossible sight of people dancing where ships had sailed became a powerful metaphor for English resilience. A contemporary poet captured it best. The Thames now paved with liquid crystal lies, and the sharp skates carved figures where fish swam. For a brief moment in history, Londoners walked on water and lived to tell the tale. 